Good morning and welcome to worship on this Palm and Passion Sunday. My name is Pastor Susan and on behalf of the people of First Church, I want to welcome you to worship on this very important and significant day. I want to first uh, take a moment to ask you to fill out the connection card. Let us know that you're here in worship and if there's any way we can be of assistance to you in the days and weeks ahead. This morning I want to take some time to outline the events and worship experiences of this Holy Week as it is the most important week in the life of those of us who profess to be Christians. Today we celebrate riding into the old city of Jerusalem with Jesus and his disciples. And we know that as the hosannas are sung and the palm branches are waved, that it makes, it, makes its way to Monday, Thursday and the Last Supper of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, of his being arrested, and of his carrying his cross and being crucified before we return for Easter Sunday morning worship next Sunday. So this morning, I would like to invite you to a stop by the church between 10 and noon. I'll be there with uh, palms if you would like a palm in honor of today's uh, Palm Sunday. We'll also be distributing communion cups for Monday, Thursday, and stones with crosses on them for our Good Friday worship as we walk the way of sorrow, the same path that Jesus walked on his way to his crucifixion and his death. Worship on Monday, Thursday will be live through Zoom, and on our website that day you will find the link to be able to join us. If you're not able to come by to pick up a cup uh, for communion, invite you just simply to have juice or wine and bread available so that we might all share in communion together. On Good Friday, worship has been pre-recorded and you can access it anytime as well as Easter Sunday morning. In addition to worship on Easter Sunday morning, it is also our love and action food and hygiene drive and want to invite and encourage all of you to stop by the church sometime between 10 and noon to be able to drop off non-perishable food items and hygiene items that we will take to our Kenosha neighbors in need and to be distributed through the Grace Welcome Center and through the Salvation Army. For all of this information and more details about our worship experiences this Holy Week, invite you to head to our website where that information will be available. Again, I welcome you as we come together to be able to celebrate this last week of Jesus' life as we walk with him through the city of Jerusalem, to the cross, to the grave, and to new life with each of us.
is Shirley Edwards, a member of First United Methodist Church, and happy to be your liturgist this morning on Palm Sunday. We'll open with our morning prayer. Good morning, dear Jesus. As Palm Sunday, we have no palms to wave to honor you as our King. All we have are empty palms of our hands. Take all of these hands, Jesus, and use them in your honor. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Woman, here is your son, and here is your mother. I am thirsty. It is finished. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Would you pray with me? Oh, dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, of all of our hearts, be acceptable to you, O Lord God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Today on Palm Sunday, also known as Passion Sunday, we continue our series on the walk of taking a look at what it means to walk more closely with God, to be able to grow in our faith, and to be able to experience that abundant life that Jesus has promised us. And we have taken a look at that through five essential practices of the Christian faith, five practices that Jesus practiced that we find in scripture and those that indeed shape our hearts and our souls and our minds as we seek to live this Christian faith in our world. Today, we're going to review those five practices, those five essential practices, and weave them in to what is known as the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. And to see that as Jesus uttered those words, that his life was shaped by these five practices over his lifetime. It is in this season of Lent that we have tried to walk more closely with Jesus and have taken a look at these five practices. Five practices which we've learned that we can do together and that are to be done individually. We've looked at worship and prayer, of study, of serving, of giving, and of sharing. And these are all things that Jesus practiced in his lifetime and that we find in scripture. So on this holy week, this very last week of Jesus' life, we walk more closely with him as we celebrate his coming into the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, as we come and receive an important gift from him, the gift of Holy Communion as it is that we walk to the cross and that we suffer alongside of him and receive that gift of forgiveness of sins. And as we already know the end of the story, we know that in the silence of Holy Saturday, it is simply a time of waiting until we gather again and rejoice at God's fulfillment of promise of new life. And so today we step back to the very beginning of that week of buying Jesus coming into the city, preparing himself for being on the cross. And we know that Jesus spent time with his disciples and his friends that week until he came to Good Friday and to the crucifixion. Now I am always uh, reminded of those seven last words that Jesus uttered from the cross and how important that they are for each of us. And I know as we are hearing them for the first time or hearing them again, that they offer to us important reminders of the ways in which God through Jesus seek to work in our lives. But first I want to back up and to think about Jesus on the cross on that Good Friday. 
and think about what does it look like to be crucified? What we know from history is that it may not look exactly like uh, the ways in which artists have portrayed it. For as we know uh, that we often say that Jesus was pierced through his hands, but the crucifixion actually would have been a piercing through the wrists to being able to have something stronger to be able to put one's body on the cross. And putting a nail through the wrist would have been excruciating pain as well, for there are a lot of nerves and tendons for those nails to go through. Interestingly, thinking about the excruciating pain that Jesus experienced, we find the word cruciate where our word crucifixion comes from. We also know that Jesus would not have any cloths around him but would have hung naked and that his feet wouldn't have been tied in front but they would have been nailed to the sides and split apart on each side of that vertical beam. So there are many theories of what happens to the body of crucifixion and how one dies, either a slow death or a quick death. What we know is for Jesus and for others, the very last moments is simply that death is called by asphyxiation or not being able to breathe anymore. As your body is hung on the cross and, and it drops, the only way that you are able to see or to breathe or to talk is to pull yourself up by the very things that are hanging your arms on the cross. And so we find that people who were crucified didn't talk very much because it was painful to exert that kind of energy that you really needed that energy for every possible breath. And so when people, as Jesus talked, those who were around would have listened very carefully. The Gospels record there are seven words or utterances from Jesus. We have the very same one that is found in Matthew and Mark, three that come from the Gospel of Luke, and three that come from the Gospel of John. And what it is that Jesus is saying to us through these utterances is important for our lives as well. Now, all of the Gospels record that it wasn't till the end of the crucifixion near Jesus' death that these words were uttered. And each of the Gospels have a little bit of different picture of how long that Jesus actually hung on the cross. Mark tells us it was from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. Matthew and Luke also agree with Mark and say it was nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. But in the Gospel of John, we read that it was simply from noon to three. And so as we look at these words uttered close to the three o'clock hour, we take a look at them and their meaning for our own lives. Now Jesus, out of the seven utterances, three of them were prayers. The very first word was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? taken from the Psalm, Psalm 23, or Psalm 22. We know that Jesus prayed and prayer was important to him, that he often went to be by himself to pray, that he prayed all night on top of a mountain before it was that he chose his disciples. We know that he prayed before meals when he blessed the meal the boy brought to feed the 5,000, or when he blessed the meal that we know as the Last Supper was given to us. We know after the Last Supper, he went out into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And when he was arrested and then taken to trial, before he was on the cross, that he also prayed the scriptures. So as one of our practices were to pray, we see that prayer was important to Jesus through his lifetime and even important to him as he hung on the cross. 
Now as Jesus prayed these prayers, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We also know from the Gospels that during that time he hung there on the cross, he was tormented, that he was mocked, he was humiliated, that Jesus knew what it felt like for God to be absent from his life. I suspect that same prayer, maybe in different words, have been prayed these last weeks with the shootings in Boulder or the shootings in Atlanta. And of course, as the latest shooting in Boulder, my mind jumped to the shooting in Aurora and the shooting in Columbine. And how much can the people of Denver actually go through? And so I imagine during those times or other times in our own lives when everything is falling apart is what Jesus teaches us is to pray the scriptures and to cry out to God. The second prayer that Jesus offered is from Psalm 31, the second utterance, into your hands, O God, I commit my spirit. William Barclay tells us that Jewish mothers everywhere taught this prayer to their children from the time that they were babies. Even though they may not have understood the words, that Jewish mothers said these words and embedded them in their children's lives. So that those moments when they were perhaps feeling alone or uncertain about the future, that they were simply able to pray as Jesus prayed, into your hands, O oh God, I commit my spirit. And you know, when you pray that prayer and let go, it is the time that you can receive God's peace, that kind of peace that passes all understanding that is promised to us in the scripture. Jesus knew scripture. It was part of who he was. He read scripture. He memorized scripture. He recited scripture. His famous books, his favorite books to recite from are from Deuteronomy, from Psalms, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. Everything that Jesus does is shaped by his reading of the scriptures. And so too, we took a look at the practice of reading scripture and invited to read five verses a day. And as a group, to consider to be part of disciple Bible study or a short-term Bible study to grow in understanding the word. Serving God while serving others was also part of uh, Jesus' prayer. That he would often pray as Isaiah did, here I am, Lord, send me. And we were invited to pray and to look for opportunities to serve, to pay attention to the ways that God could use us and help us to see the needs of others a few days before Palm Sunday, Jesus said to his disciples and those who were gathered around him, the Son of Man, for that's the way in which he uh, defined himself, came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus believed that his death would redeem the world. And as he thought of the world, and believed that his death would serve a purpose. It is that he thinks first of his mother. Now, if we think back to the cross again, in paintings we see crosses that are, are towering to the sky. But in essence, the Roman crosses were really only about six and a half, seven feet high. So that as the gospels tell us that Mary, his mother, was there, she could have been close to her son. She could have touched him. I can't even begin to imagine the anguish that she must have felt being so close and knowing there was nothing she could do to help her son at the moment but to be present. And while Mary was standing close to Jesus and John, who is often known as the beloved disciple, was standing near to her. Jesus uttered the next words, Woman, here 
is your son. And to John he said, here is your mother. As I contemplate those words from the cross, that often Jesus is calling us to pay attention to others who might become like parents to us, to be able to, in church, in our neighborhoods, to be able to see others who are part of our lives. How do we reach out and share our love and care of them? St. Francis of Assisi said, uh, preach always, but use words only when necessary. And so when Jesus was dying on the cross, his whole life became a sermon, and a sermon with a few words. Luke 19 tells us again that Jesus, when he was there on the cross seeking to serve, he said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. For it was that Jesus reached out, cared for, and served everyone. He went to those who were least accepted, those who were sinners and outcasts. And so when we look at the cross, we remember the life of Jesus and how Jesus was not just for some, but for all of us. And lastly, in Jesus' third prayer, he reminds us again that no one is excluded from his redeeming love and work on the cross. For his third prayer was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he took a look at those who were mocking him, as he took a look at the bandits and thieves who were on either side of him, that is, he took a look at everyone who was around. He prayed that God might forgive them. But it wasn't only Jesus forgiving those who were there that day in the first century. Tony Campolo, a contemporary Christian writer and professor, says that God makes no sense of time, that past, present, and future is all one. And so when Jesus was peering down and looking at those who were around him in the cross, he also was looking into the future and looking at each of us as well and saying not only to them but to us father forgive them for they know not what they do that he prayed this prayer for each of us and for everything that we have done wrong for everything that we have left undone, for that which we haven't even intentionally known what we have done. And then the gospel writer, of course, brings up the two thieves, the bandits, the, the epitome of what is, is the worst about human life. And one mocked Jesus, and the other must have been captivated by those words in that prayer of Jesus. For he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you remember what Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. For the response of Jesus was to reach out to us and to be able to bring us back into his fold. There was a generosity and a self-giving aspect of Jesus' life in his ministry and even from the cross when he becomes a model of reaching out to others, of being able to offer a selfless love to those who were around him and to us that we are to give to one another. The cross in and of itself is a picture of God's self-giving love to us. For we read in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Martin Luther tells us this is the gospel in miniature of knowing how much God loves each of us, no matter how much we have mucked things up, that God loves us and forgives us and it is in this self-giving of Jesus that we know of his sharing 
and of his witness to us and to the world. And so as two last words, I thirst and it is finished, reminds us that it comes to the end of his life when he simply says, my mission is accomplished. What I have come here to do, I have done. And on the cross, I have given everything in my life to each of you and to all of humanity. And so as we reflect about Jesus being on the cross in his last words, we also know that those last words in his life were shaped by the five practices that have helped us to walk more closely with God this season of Lent to worship and pray, to study the scriptures, to serve God by serving others, to give generously, and to be able to share what our faith means to us in hopes of a full life for another. So when we look at the cross this week, may we see the picture that God is painting for us Acknowledging that as humans, we all struggle with sin, that we all feel a sense of brokenness and at times unworthiness, and all are in need of forgiveness. But it is God pouring out God's self to us through Jesus by saying, I love you, and I love you this much. There was a book that I used to read to our boys of guess how much I love you. And every mother would say to their child, I love you this much. And the response is, well, I love you this much. And one couldn't even grasp the abundance of the love because it kept on growing and extending farther. Well, that's exactly what God says to us. I will give you everything everything so that you might have life and that you might know of my love. Everything in this moment on this cross has been poured out and given to you. And so come to me. Let me forgive you. You are mine. I love you this day and always. What wondrous love is this? Amen. Our prayer requests are as follows. From the three to five-year-olds, that a virus to go away. From the elementary classes, prayers for people who are sick and sad. <clears throat> that everyone stay safe. That everyone has a good spring and summer. Gratitude for the COVID vaccines. Nancy Matthews and her cancer treatments. Nancy Matthews friend, Claudia, whose husband Keith was diagnosed with cancer. Jane Freitag's friend who is transitioning to eternal life. Shirley Edwards on the loss of her sister-in-law. Confirmation, middle school students going through testing and all students experiencing the stress of school and exams. May they find peace in any anxiety they are feeling. Families of those lost in Boulder, Colorado shootings. Prayers for the Asian community and all those affected by the recent violence in Atlanta. <clears throat> Please join me now in our breakthrough prayer. God, let your love light the path you would have us travel. Empower us and grant us the courage to include all people in the work you would have us do. Amen.
Good morning, Lord. Why did this happen? Why did our Savior die on the cross? We should know he died for all of our sins, that his death was to save all of us so we could continue your work, to be your hands and your feet to bring hope, peace, joy, and love to this struggling world. There is so much hatred, distrust, and division among us. Help us to reach out with a helping hand. The pandemic has caused fear and loss of loved ones. With your grace, may we get it under control soon. Lord, help us to really listen and to choose ways that will be helpful and beneficial to everyone. We pray that all the people you put in our paths not only will help us with our faith walk, but allow us to help them. Lord, we know that you will never forsake us. May your light always keep the Holy Spirit in our hearts as we read and study your word. Thank you, Lord, for the abundant gift of grace that you have freely given to us. May we use it wisely to love and care for others. I pray this in your precious son's name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue to worship by offering to God his tithes in our offerings. You may give electronically by clicking on the give button or by mailing your contribution to the church or bringing it to the church during our next Love in Action Food and Hygiene Drive on Sunday, April 4th. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and guidance of our Holy Spirit be with us all as we walk more closely with God and walk next to our Lord and Savior this week. Amen. Amen.